Hey guys, this is Mark Cutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and I wanted to talk today about uh, the reasons it's important to get a diagnosis. If you suspect that you have Asperger's syndrome or maybe you're married to a neurotypical partner or spouse and they have suggested that you have Asperger's syndrome, it would be good to know. I run into a lot of situations where I, I get emails from the neurotypical wife, for example, and she suspects that her uh, husband has Asperger's syndrome, but he refuses to uh, seek a formal diagnosis. Um, he has no interest in researching it, has no interest in marital counseling. In fact, worse than that, he flips it around and blames her for the problems, for the relationship problems, instead of looking at the fact that he may have a developmental disorder. So there's, there's some good reasons why you would want to Seek a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis, in the event that you think or your partner or spouse thinks that you have Asperger's syndrome. So let's look at a few important reasons why you may want to consider that. A diagnosis, for one thing, can provide a framework for labeling, understanding, and learning about the behavioral and emotional challenges that have been baffling up to this point. A diagnosis is going to help others in your life to understand you and respond differently to your odd behavior. Also, getting a diagnosis removes the mystery and diminishes the shame associated with being a bit weird, which leads to a greater sense of community and begins the process of learning to live more adaptively with an Asperger's brain. So if you have Asperger's, you're probably a visual thinker in a verbal world. So with an Asperger's diagnosis, you can get the help and accommodations you need to complete courses, tests, and interviews, other things to get the work that you want. You may get easily overwhelmed anytime there's too much sensory input. For example, parties at the mall, grocery store, sporting events, and so on. And you'd very much like to be comfortable taking part in these ordinary activities. The problem could be Asperger's. And part of the solution could be getting, the di getting that diagnosis. You may have a tough time making or keeping friends and you don't know why. Or your friends are only interested in you when you're engaged in an activity you share but you haven't built a personal relationship with anyone yet. The issue could be Asperger's related. Let's say you meet someone special. You're interested in making a move. Now what? Dating is tough for anyone, but if you have Asperger's, it's downright confusing and anxiety ridden. So you need help? You might need to start with an Asperger's diagnosis. You may never seem to get a job that reflects your abilities, even though all your credentials are terrific on paper or you're passed over for promotion regularly because you just don't get the office politics. Could be Asperger's. You've been called obsessive, but you feel you're just very interested in one incredibly interesting subject or activity. You like to figure out whether you're right or wrong and make a good decision about whether to try to expand your interests. It would help to know whether or not you have Asperger's. You've been feeling different your entire life. Now you're hoping to find a community of individuals who get who you are, how you think, and even how you feel. A diagnosis of Asperger's will most likely give you the push you need to get in touch with support groups and connect with that community. So suffice it to say, it's never too late to increase self-awareness in order to capitalize on, capitalize on your strengths and work around areas of challenge. And there are many more strengths associated with Asperger's syndrome than deficits or weaknesses. You certainly can improve your life greatly by capitalizing on your strengths, and you have many of those. Knowing about Asperger's gives you an explanation, not an excuse, for why your life has taken the twists and turns that it has. If you are a neurotypical woman in a relationship with a spouse or partner with Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism, you undoubtedly have bigger challenges to overcome than you ever thought possible. There may be days where you feel all alone in your trials and tribulations, and maybe you've been so busy taking care of your Asperger's husband that you haven't had the opportunity to seek support from those who have traveled a similar road. As a partner of someone on the autism spectrum, you're most likely aware that he or she somehow always finds a 
way to get under your skin. There are so many changes that may be going on within your Asperger's partner emotionally, especially in the anxiety department. Furthermore, his meltdowns, unpredictable temper, and natural instinct of reclusiveness may make communication nearly impossible. So short of going to marriage and family counseling with someone who has an expertise in autism spectrum disorders, and by the way, there is a link below this video if you would want to investigate that, here are a few ideas to keep in mind. They're simple, but yet they're so terribly important. So here's a real simple one to start out with. Pick your battles carefully. Your Asperger's husband will feel more resistant to what you have to say if you tend to lecture him about every perceived transgression. So decide what's really important and focus your efforts on those behaviors only. Just address one issue at a time. Another crucial technique is to record your moments of success and failure in a journal. So you're going to be keeping a journal and recording incidents, which can help you to look back and see if there are any patterns or contributing factors to the relationship difficulties. The journal may be a good thing to look through with your husband as well, talking about both the positives and negatives. Also, be sure to log and monitor any medications. Don't forget, medications can have side effects that contribute to meltdowns, shutdowns, anxiety, and depression. So on those occasions where there is some relationship conflict that you really feel needs to be addressed, before you go in and confront the situation, visualize yourself going in with a very calm state of mind. Relax your facial muscles and keep your voice down. You have to remember that a person with Asperger's syndrome is always on high alert and even the thought of having a talk, quote unquote, raises his anxiety immediately. So he's already on guard, so to speak. So when faced with an angry Asperger's husband who's been aggressive and shouting, you want to keep your voice neutral and lower the volume and pitch of your voice. Any more emotion into an already emotional situation only clouds judgments, causes greater confusion, and launches your Asperger's spouse closer to a meltdown. Lastly, understand when professional help is needed. Most people with Asperger's and high-functioning autism benefit from some type of professional help in identifying the underlying reasons for their problems. So getting your husband or wife with Asperger's syndrome when she first starts having difficulties is usually far more successful than waiting until problems get worse. If the relationship problems have piled up for two or three or five or ten or twenty years, it's not going to be impossible to come up with a communication strategy such that most conflict is resolved, but it's going to be infinitely more difficult to do that after the ten-year mark, so to speak, than after the one-year mark. People on the autism spectrum with behavioral issues don't respond well to traditional counseling. Instead, they require specialized techniques that are tailored to their specific abilities, deficits, challenges, and so on. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com, and today I wanted to talk to some of the NT partners, uh, especially uh, neurotypical wives, as to why your attempt at damage control often fails. And what I mean by damage control is uh, the relationship is not firing on all eight cylinders. In fact, it may be down to just two or three cylinders, and it's sputtering all over the place. And it has been on the decline for several months, if not years. And so you've uh, made your best effort to try to get your Asperger's or high-functioning autistic spouse or partner on the same page with you and understand, you know, hey, we're in trouble here. This relationship is drowning. Can we be a team and work with me as a team player and let's see if we can fix this thing. And so that's your attempt at damage control and that's the term I'm using here. So when we're in some form of distress, either psychologically or physically, uh, we tend to want to reach out for assistance and we may do that by asking for help, telling people we need help, complaining if we're not being heard by those who can help. We may yell, we may get angry if we have to, you know, so we would start off basically asking for assistance. And then when repeated requests for assistance go unanswered, then we can escalate to getting aggressive because we're really in need of some assistance at this point. 
So when we're in some state of need and we can't uh, fulfill that need by ourselves and we really need the assistance from somebody else, we often assume that A, the people that we reach out to or the person that we're reaching out to will listen, B, they will understand what we're going through and have some empathy and compassion, and C, they will do their best to help if they love us and care about us, right? So, for example, as a child, when you had a safety need and uh, that need was going unmet for whatever reason, and you made it known that this need was going unmet, your parents most often would jump in and take care of that need. They'd make sure that you had plenty of liquids, plenty of food, shelter. They taught you about safety measures to take when you crossed the street, and so on. They protected you. They did their best, in most cases, to meet your needs. So if we had decent parenting growing up, we just assume now as adults that those who love and care for us will be interested in meeting our needs, especially when we're we're in some state of psychological or physiological distress. We just assume that our significant other, our partner or spouse, who supposedly loves and cares for us, will be very interested in meeting our needs similar to how our parents did. But when we have a certain set of needs, and let's use the example of when we need some emotional reciprocity, we need some quality time from our partner, we need some validation and so on, and we don't get these basic emotional needs met, we will tend to cry out for help in a way. And that kind of looks like a lot of complaining, anger, even months and years of having the need unmet, it can turn into resentment and bitterness. Now, if we're in a relationship with someone on the autism spectrum who has mind blindness issues, alexithymia issues, then we are in a situation where we're with somebody who is not going to reciprocate as much as we need. So when we're in a relationship and we're not getting our emotional needs met, we're not getting emotional reciprocity or validation, we're not getting our feelings listened to, we feel like we're misunderstood, we feel like we're not as important to the other person as his or her work or special interest, then we do want to make it known that, hey, I'm really suffering here, please help me out, please meet these needs, this is how it's supposed to be, normal people meet one another's needs in this way why can't this happen in this relationship so the NT wife complains vehemently that her needs are going unmet and she tries desperately to have a connection and the more she does this the more she pushes him away him being the high functioning autistic husband because now he's retreating as a form of anxiety reduction he's retreating into his special interest into his work into his man cave any place to get away from what is now his main source of anxiety. Think of this example here. Let's say you're a child and you, both of your parents are on the autism spectrum and you fall and scrape your knee really bad and it's bleeding and you're crying and you're hysterical and your parents go, hey, you need to calm down because all that screaming and crying is really raising my stress and I'm not going to be able to help you until you calm down. And so they leave. They go to the other end of the house and they leave you over there bleeding to figure it out for yourself because your approach is stressing them out and they can't help you when they're stressed out, so they retreat. Of course, that scenario is ridiculous, right? Similarly, as the NT wife tries to cry out to her high-function autistic husband and say, look, I'm suffering over here. I'm having some mental health issues. I'm having some physical health issues. My emotional needs are not being met. I feel like I'm shriveling up like a flower that's not getting water. Can you please connect with me and give me some emotional reciprocity, some empathy, some validation? Just listen to my feelings. Listen to, to my thoughts as I describe them. Try to understand what I'm going through. And all of these pleas for help end up pushing him further away, which now makes the NT wife think, I am never going to get my needs met here. I am totally lost as to what to do. And my best efforts to reconnect fail. 
Now back to the childhood example again, where you've fallen and scraped your knee, you would never have the thought, okay, well, my parents just said I'm crying too loudly and they've left. They, they don't want to help me because I'm being too noisy. So I'll stop crying. I'll wipe my tears away. I'll bandage up my knee on my own and then I can reconnect with my parents. They'll be okay with me then. Of course, you wouldn't do that. Similarly, as an NT wife in a relationship with an autistic husband, you wouldn't go, well, uh, it's been two or three years since I've had my emotional needs met, and uh, so I think what I'm going to do is just meet my own emotional needs. Um, I'll just have to make sure that I validate myself and listen to myself and understand myself and take care of myself. Y you wouldn't do that, right? It would be ridiculous because as a five-year-old child, you can't parent yourself. And as a 35-year-old adult, you can't be in a marriage with yourself. So this brings us to the point of what can be done. And what has to be done is the approach that you are using to reach out for help. In this case, with your significant other who is on the autism spectrum. The way that you're trying to establish a reconnection. The way you're trying to get validation. Someone to listen to you. Someone to understand you. Someone to spend quality time with you. Somebody to make you feel important. The approach that you're using has to yield the opposite effect of pushing that person away. What would be the opposite effect? That would be pulling them in. How do you pull them in? The answer is to come up with a communication strategy that does not raise the anxiety of your autistic partner. Because as soon as his anxiety has launched, all efforts to receive a quality connection, empathy, validation, understanding, cooperation will be lost. Because now the autistic husband, in this case, will be more concerned about self-preservation. How do you find this communication strategy? It's going to be important for you to find a marriage and family therapist or a counselor, psychiatrist, whomever, who has some expertise in autism spectrum disorders and will know how to come up with a strategy that can keep the autistic person's anxiety low, while at the same time getting the neurotypical's emotional needs met. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and I wanted to respond to an email that I got from a, in this case it was a neurotypical wife who is married to a husband with Asperger's Syndrome and her question is in reference to a video that I put up a few days ago and I'll have the link to that below this video which describes how people with Asperger's Syndrome tend to prefer spending time with their special interest or their work more so than relationships. She's wanting to know what, what do you do in a case where you're wanting to have a deeper connection with, you know, in this case, an Asperger's husband who does seem to be preoccupied with his, in this case, uh, computer gaming. And she's kind of feeling isolated and unloved. So the question is, what do you do in a case like this? Keep in mind that people with Asperger's syndrome, they have less of a need for social connection. They have a small relationship gas tank, so to speak. We'll use an example of uh, Thanksgiving Day, where you, being the neurotypical wife, you could probably go to your family on Thanksgiving Day and spend three to five hours chatting, laughing, sharing stories, and so on. And you drag your Asperger's husband along with you. After about 30 minutes, he's burnt out. And he may hibernate over in the corner somewhere and play on his cell phone. And it's not like he's purposely trying to be antisocial. It's just that his relationship tank is full. And now he needs a time out, so to speak, in order to uh, de-stress. Think of it like this. Um, you know, the thermostat determines the temperature in the house. Your apostat determines level of hunger. And I'm going to make up a term here. We'll just call it the relatio stat. So you will need to dial down your relatio stat somewhat. So in dialing down your relatio stat, what you're doing is you're trying to more closely match his level of relationship emotional needs. And that would include sharing feelings, validating one another's feelings, sharing experiences, talking about one another's day, different forms of affection, and so on. He's going to have that need met more quickly than you. So rather than taking it personally, 
and thinking, well, he doesn't want to talk to me or he's being insensitive or uncaring. What's going on there is that his tank is full and yours is not. So in this case, it's highly recommended that you get your uh, the rest of your relationship needs met elsewhere with close family and friends. You need to top off your tank because his tank is full quickly and yours is not. But you need and you deserve to top off your tank, but you may have to do that with close friends and, and family members. You may find that you'll have to go to some parties by yourself or some social gatherings by yourself to get your social needs met. Another thing to consider is joining him in his special interest. If your goal is to spend more time with him and his goal is to spend as much time as possible with his special interest, in some cases it's possible for the uh, neurotypical wife to actually join the husband with Asperger's in his special activity. In this way, it's a win-win because he's continuing to do what he values with his time, and then you're also doing what you value with your time. But I understand it's a tough row to hoe any way you look at it because if your social emotional needs are high and his are low, it is kind of a chronic mismatch. And it can create problems if you take that personally. But as I stated earlier, in the vast majority of cases, the Asperger's husband, who seems self-absorbed and disconnected from family, is not doing so intentionally. So to help you uh, make more sense of this, I want you to click on the link below and watch this other video that will help you understand why uh, people with Asperger's syndrome tend to prefer spending as much time as possible with their special interest, more so than with their significant other. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton, and I got a question from a neurotypical wife regarding her Asperger's husband, and I'm going to paraphrase what the email states. She is just wanting to know why her husband is so logical and hardly any, shows hardly any emotions whatsoever, especially when they're arguing. He tends to, using her words now, rattle on endlessly with logic and rationalizations. So he uh, evidently lectures his uh, neurotypical wife and uh, doesn't really connect with her on an emotional level. And I wanted to explain a little bit about that, just if there are other wives or girlfriends experiencing the same thing. Or maybe you're the husband that's the neurotypical and you have a uh, wife who is has Asperger's or high-functioning autism. So people with Asperger's or high-functioning autism, they of course they have emotions, uh, but they turn their emotions way down. Not completely off, just way down. And the reason they do this, it, it's because they have learned to turn their emotions way down because they get in the way of making evidence-based decisions. People with Asperger's truly are very logical, in fact, overly logical and under-emotional. They don't understand their feelings. They don't understand other people's feelings so much. So to people with Asperger's, words are not evidence. They're just words. To them, words are just tools to convey a thought or a process, and they're inherently empty. Words are inherently empty until they're filled with truth. So it's not that people with Asperger's have little room for emotions. They just don't see any need for them. In fact, in their way of thinking, emotions just get in the way of completing tasks. Emotions just get in the way of problem solving. In fact, their motto could be remove the emotions and accomplish the task more efficiently. So they are very task oriented. They're very much into uh, their special interests, and their special interests very rarely, if ever, involve people. Um, so it's not that they also it's not that they have to have things their way all the time. I know that if you're an an NT spouse of an Asperger's uh, husband or wife, you know that it seems like they always have to have it their way. It's their way or the highway. And they're so stubborn. Once they've locked in to their opinion, they can't be swayed otherwise. But it's not that they have to have their way all the time. If you, as the NT wife or husband, can provide some reasonable logic with proof that your way is better than theirs, they will they will listen to what you have to say and they'll go along with your plan. So, 
to help you understand why you're back to the email from this NT wife to help your, you understand why your Asperger's husband um, is overly logical and doesn't really connect with you on an emotional level just remember that in his mind words are only uncorroborated statements not evidence they think that neurotypical people say things all the time that have no value because NTs often say things that aren't backed by evidence. They're always searching for evidence. What's the truth? They're very truth aspies or very truth oriented and very fact oriented. Um, so they often disregard words as empty, meaningless garbage. They only respect the truth. So when your words are logical and match his logic, when your words are truthful and matches his sense of truth, the, both of you will be on the same page. Now, I understand that therein lies the dilemma because you don't speak Asperger's, so to speak, right? There's, there's French, there's German. You may or may not speak French. You may or may not speak German. And if you're a neurotypical spouse, you definitely don't speak Asperger's. Your brain is simply not wired the way the Asperger's brain is wired. And so it is hard to kind of get on the same page with your Asperger's husband when he's so damn logical all the time because that's just simply not your style. Another reason that there may seem to be a disconnect when you're talking to your Asperger's husband and he's overly logical is the fact that he doesn't speak body language. So let's use the analogy of, of uh, French and German again. You know, you may or may not speak French, you may or may not speak German, but you definitely speak body language. The the person with Asperger's does not speak body language. In other words, they don't pick up on facial cues. They don't pick up on body language, like if you're crossing your arms, uh, if you have a disgusted look or a sad look or an empathic look, they're just not going to get that. So they're only listening. They're only picking up on what you have to say, not on the body language behind what you're saying. And to make matters worse, and we just alluded to this earlier, if you're not providing factual evidence in your arguments or in when you're giving your opinion, not only is your body language discounted, but your words are also discounted or not valued, we'll say. So I know this doesn't help you feel better uh, as you're dealing with your husband, but hopefully at least help you understand why there seems to be this disconnect and why you're sucked into these lengthy uh, lectures, overly logical lectures that you refer to. Visit livingwithaspergerspartner.com for more information on this topic and others. So, are you an individual on the autism spectrum who has been blamed by your partner or spouse of being insensitive, selfish, and even narcissistic? If so, you may have a condition that is a comorbid condition of Asperger's or high-functioning autism. And I run into this pretty much in every case when I'm working with couples. Um, the NT spouse almost without exception blames the autistic spouse of purposefully being uh, selfish and uncaring and totally lacking in empathy. So we'll take a deep dive here and look at alexithymia, which is the uh, condition associated in most cases, if not all cases, of Asperger's and high-functioning autism. If I have alexithymia, um, I have a real difficulty recognizing emotions and their subtleties and textures. It makes it real difficult for me to understand the intricacies of what others feel and think. Uh, some more examples would be, I, if I have this condition, I would have a detached and tentative connection to others. I'd be hypersensitive to some physical sensations, perhaps 
especially touch, uh, would have a constricted style of thinking, limited or rigid imagination, and I would have difficulty recognizing facial cues in others, expressing feelings, identifying different types of feelings, and I would have a limited understanding of what even causes feelings. Now, there are two dimensions to alexithymia. One would be called the affective dimension, and this is where difficulties arise in reacting, expressing, feeling, and imagining, which would be the experiencing part of our emotional experience. And then there's also the cognitive dimension, and this is where the individual struggles to identify, interpret, and verbalize feelings, which is the thinking part of our emotional experience. So if I have alexithymia, I'm basically emotionally unresponsive. And this can be perceived by my neurotypical spouse as being uncaring or just not making her important. So it's important for your neurotypical spouse to realize that the missed cues, the flat reactions, or the lack of emotional recognition have real psychological and neurobiological origins. I have run into countless people on the autism spectrum when we're doing relationship work where the individual with alexithymia has been literally punished shamed and even mocked for his or her emotional unresponsiveness. If this is the case with you, realize that your neurotypical partner does not speak, hear, or sense the same emotional language as you. And as a result, and as you probably have experienced, this can cause a lot of conflict and misunderstandings in the relationship. So what can be done? Well, if I have this condition called alexithymia, my goal is going to be to strengthen my ability to identify and understand feelings. I'll need to begin the business of teaching myself about the subjective experiences of others. I'll need to keep in mind that stretching and learning emotional awareness is also going to be a very long journey for me, especially if I'm 35, 45, 55 years old. But there are some things that can be done to improve in this area. And I will put a few suggestions to get you started on uh, some self-help strategies below this video. So in summary, alexithymia is a trait that makes it hard for me to find words for thoughts and to find words for feelings. It's kind of a, a lack of vocabulary in the emotions department. This can be mild to moderate to severe. Some people have such a mild version of alexithymia that it virtually goes unnoticed. Others have a severe form of alexithymia such that their partners almost believe that uh, he or she is narcissistic or even sociopathic, quite honestly. So when identified, alexithymia can be treated with the goal of making feelings and their textures easier to navigate. And again, if you look below this video, I have a few suggestions to get you started.